I felt like Liverpool needed its own dedicated asset house party. And I knew that the State was the place to do it. The State was the coolest nightclub in Liverpool, but no one was playing like the, the New York, Chicago sound of dance music. Two resident DJs in the State, one of them called Andy Carroll, another guy called Mike Nola. In 86, Mike went to New York and brought back this amazing new electronic sound, uh, which they called house music. We started integrating it with like Francois Kevorkian mixes of the Smiths and New Order and uh, Lloyd Cole and throwing that in with the cramps and just mixing it all up. Uh, someone turned up to the club one time from London and said, flipping heck mate, you're Balearic. I said, I'm what? I mean, I'd never heard of the place at the time. I didn't know where Ibiza was. Uh, didn't even know there's any islands called the Valerics at that point. I had no idea who James Martin was. He was 17 and he knew about house music from going to events, I think, in Europe. He was a ticket tout. That's how he made his money. September the 12th, 1988 was the first night we did. I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, really nervous. We opened up the door and there was literally one person outside waiting to come in. His name was John Kelly. Do, 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 do. A scouser. But there's nothing else you can say. John Kelly was a scouser. Who turned out to be some crazy guy from Liverpool who became a really famous DJ as well. Did I ever go to Daisy in the States? I was first in last house. I don't think I knew John before that. I always remember it because the States had like a shutter. That went up. He was so impatient. The shutter hadn't even risen to like, you know, his height. He was under like so quick and in. He was like, right, let's go. <laughs> Daisy was a Monday night. You know, which is crazy to think they had 500, you know, 500,000 people out on a Monday night, all acid dancing, you know what I mean? I quickly realised he was as passionate about the music as me and Andy was and Mike. And um, we became friends very quickly and then we, we started working together. We got off at the club called The Underground in 1988, 89. And I moved on to The Underground Club with, with the guys and uh, that's where John cut his teeth DJing. Uh, and James, actually. For me, one of the great nights in Liverpool, and it was this little pokey place that, you know, was full of, like, ravers and gangsters. Liverpool was a pretty rough town, and probably still is in so many ways, but but pretty much then it was, it was, it was everybody under the groove. It got shut down by the police, because at the time it was anything that had a, a repetitive beat on it in town got shut down by the police. But for me, that was the spark of Liverpool, um, the underground, and they had a place like Quadrant Park as well going on, which I, I never went to Quadrant Park, but I heard it was like possibly the maddest place on earth, you know. That went from strength to strength. Coaches coming from Aberdeen, from Land's End, I mean, London, Bristol, all over the country. James Barton and John Kelly joined us in the Quadrant Park all night. So for me, the beginnings of the Liverpool house scene are those four people. Mike Nola, Andy Carroll, James Barton, John Kelly. In them days, the DJs weren't even the star of the show, you know what I mean? It was all about the music. You used to have your decks against the wall and your back to the crowd, which is really, you know, unheard of now. And as the piano or the break would come in, the scream would go up. The hairs on the back of your neck, as because it was so forceful, there was so much energy in there. And you knew as you were bringing the fader across that it was all coming up. And as you turn around, the place would be exploding. People hanging off every bit of furniture because it was three stories high. It was unbelievable. Like, it was one of the best places I've ever played, still to this day. And it was the first real legal all-nighter. It started off very well, but because security wasn't done properly, we started to hear tales of people being mugged and so on in the toilets. And the Radio City DJ, who was a friend of mine, cousin Massey, he went to the loo and came back covered in blood, he'd been robbed. So it did go horribly wrong towards the end, because the owner had all of his doormen at the door guarding the money. And imagine if it's £10 to get in, and there are 5,000 people in, so there's 50,000 quid at the door. When it closed, it was probably just as well because, you know, people were being hurt, basically. Thank you, and good night to you. See you next year.
Five One came about, a guy by the name of John Smith approached us and said, I'm building a purpose-built dance club. And this was Liverpool's real answer to the Hacienda. This is the 051 Club, which is leading Liverpool's challenge to Manchester. It's revived people going out in Liverpool who were pre previously going to other places. Um, it's something the city's been crying out for for years. You know, a club that's run by clubbers for clubbers. Um, and now it's happening. Not only is it here for Liverpool, but it's here for the North West. Left 051 with a storming lineup: Paul Oakenfold, Tony Humphreys, Sasha, the whole lot. You know, after we decided to leave the 051, certainly I felt like, and I think I even did an interview at the time saying, that I don't really want to do any more like clubs, I'm going to concentrate on the record label. Me and James, at this point, had um, a management company, production company, um, all these little offshoots from our Acid House adventures, basically. Uh, met Darren Hughes. We went to the Cream venue, which is called Nation. And then Darren came to me and said, look, um, we should start a night in this club. And I was like, no, 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 don't want to do it at the night. Really don't want to do it. He said, let's, let's give it a go. It's a great little venue. And I think me and Darren and Andy sort of went, okay, look, we'll, we'll do this. Let's do this. Let's do this together. You know, let's try and do it the right way. So let's go back to the roots of what electronic dance music was. And that was it, you know, October 1992, we launched. Um, it was called Cream. Cream on Saturday at Liverpool's Academy has been going for nine months. There are two dance floors, an upstairs chill out area, and room for a thousand scousers to sweat it out in a warehouse atmosphere. I still spin here at Cream every Saturday night. I uh, play for about two hours. My music ranges from house to techno. It's the atmosphere we create helps bring some great people here. So the people bring all the great people with them. Uh, we bring some of the best DJs from all over the world, not just from England to the club. Suddenly, Cream was like the Ministry of Sound and lots of other nightclubs, but pretty much Ministry and Cream are the biggest. And I remember going there, you know, just to go there before I was DJing there. You know, just to see, and I met see Graham Park and Andy Carroll and Paul Bleasdale, and it was just an amazing place. It was a really fantastic, fantastic place to be. And, you know, so when I got asked to be resident now, it's over the moon. My first experience of electronic music was in Cream, so seeing people like Lauren Garney, Six Hour Set, and Yannick's. Throughout the night, I was just like, I was just locked. I couldn't even go to the bar. I was like right in the middle of the dance floor and I couldn't move. And like, from that night, I just became obsessed. I couldn't stop thinking about it. That opened my eyes to a new world. That was me wanting to buy my own records. Not to be a DJ, just, I just wanted the music. Cream was, you belong to those people. I mean, if you didn't get on with them, you probably wouldn't have lasted very well, long there at all. You know, it was very, you know, you had to be part of Cream. You had to be part of the people in Cream and you had to be, um, you know, you had to have Cream running through your blood. I mean, lots of people used to get Cream tattoos and stuff. <laughs> it was a, you know, it was a, it, I think it was a way of life. I went to the very first night. I can remember Andy playing a remix of uh, Sister Sledge, We Are Family, right at the end, as he was swigging his bottle of tequila. I quite like uh, having a drink occasionally, you know. It's uh, quite a nice, uh, relaxing pastime, you know. When you went, you knew you were at one of the best clubs in the world, and to have that on your doorstep was pretty amazing. By 94, um, you know, dance music suddenly just literally exploded. It's like it happened overnight. It's not like it happened in one place and gradually spread around. In certain key cities, it just blew up and suddenly lots of people were going out and dancing like crazy to the new sound. And um, we were equipped to deal with it. So uh, yeah, rave we did. We'd expanded the club. The club was like 3,000 people and like 4,000 outside and coaches coming from all over the country. You know, that was the year that I think Mix Mag had coined the phrase super club, super DJs. We were seeing the brand growing in terms of like millions of records and, you know, tours around the world and merchandise and company. We had our own shop and everything else. 400,000 records we sold. It was like, Ridiculous. It was like the biggest album. We like sold more records than Kylie Minogue. It was a really crazy time for me and Darren personally as well. Fated in magazines as like two of the most important people in music. You know, amazing stuff. But but at the time, you know, as two young guys who were literally on this roller coaster ride or like riding this crest of this wave, then really struggling to manage the business. Very inexperienced, very young. Um, thought it would last forever. You know, pretty much they're the same old story. And the tension that that created internally 
was tough, which eventually led to Dan and me splitting up, Dan and leaving the company, which was a real shame. You know, maybe with hindsight, both could have worked harder to prevent that from happening, but, but it happened, you know, it was, it was splitting up, it was a bit like a divorce. You know? The 90s was the rise and the downfall of dance music. And what we have today is post 90s, the group from that point. I sold Cream in 2012 to Live Nation. Even though Live Nation owns Cream and it's still part of what I do, my brother runs Cream. He runs Cream in the UK and obviously, you know, Cream feels festivals, which are hugely successful. It's something I'll look back upon, you know, when I'm 65, 70, and I've got my kids or my grandkids, and I'm telling them where it all came from. A, tiny nightclub in Liverpool.